Good morning, guys. Uh, welcome to the beginning of the last day of Effective Altruism Global. Uh, we'll be kicking off the day with Rob Wiblin, the Director of Research at 80,000 Hours, talking about some of the flow-through effects, some of the long-term implications of the actions that we do on the welfare of humanity and, and animals around the world. Um, it's a really important topic to be engaging with because it's so easy to try to quantify the very short-term implications of the things that we do. But if we do care about the long-term well-being of humanity and other sentient beings, this is really a topic that we should start being attuned to. So with that, Rob Wiblin. Thanks, Roxanne. Um, this is actually a better turnout than I was expecting. Uh, there's no way I'd be up at this time of the morning, 9 a.m., uh, go to a talk after being at a party last night, uh, unless I was the one giving the talk. So if, you're, uh, so if you're just joining us on YouTube because you decided to sleep in, you have my greatest sympathy, I totally would have done the same thing. So as Roxanne said, uh, this talk is about flow-through effects and the effect of uh, different actions on the, on the very long term. But I should give you a, a health warning first. This is the talk about flow-through effects that your mother warned you about. This is not going to be super inspiring necessarily. It can be a little bit demoralizing to think about how hard it can be to affect the long term. But, uh, and, and I also have uh, more questions really than answers here. So I don't have a simple thesis that I'm just going to be pushing on you. Uh, I'm going to be describing some of the issues that exist here and some of the questions that are, that are still open. Uh, so it's not going yeah, to have a simple, simple ending necessarily. It can be quite hard to forecast what effects our actions are going to have. And things that initially seem bad can end up being good in the long run. And we probably all experience this in our own life as well. Uh, and if, uh, yeah, but I think this, this isn't a reason to not bother trying to the, the long-term effects of our actions. Because if we can't predict what effect our actions are going to have, even on a balance of probability standard, then they're probably not very valuable to, to do in the first place. So first, uh, I just want to define some terms here, because there's a lot of different words that people use to describe uh, flow-through effects, and that was the initial name for this talk. But Toby Ord convinced me that we should do a bit of rebranding here, get rid of the term flow-through effects, which is a bit unnecessarily vague, and start talking about indirect effects, which I'm going to define as um, effects that affect someone other than the person you initially intended to target, and long-term effects, which are effects that um, occur after the present generation is dead, at least assuming we have uh, normal human lifespans. So in the long term, all effects are going to be indirect. I'll just uh, describe some of the hypotheses that are, that are relevant to whether flow-through effects matter very much. The first one is the astronomical stakes idea, uh, which um, Bostrom came up with, and he, he gave it that name. And in fact, I'm stealing a lot of ideas from Bostrom in this talk. And the idea here is that what matters most of all is what happens to the vast amount of energy in the universe. Currently, there's an enormous number of stars out there, an enormous amount of matter and energy, but as far as we can tell, it's basically producing something like zero value. It's just hydrogen sitting there in deep space or suns burning up. It's not something that we would regard as particularly valuable or particularly harmful. But if we organized it in the right way, then it could be extremely valuable or extremely harmful. Yeah, so if we organized the universe in the right way, it could be incredibly valuable or there could be a lot of bad stuff in it. Um, and the scale of the, the value that the whole rest of the universe produces is trillions of trillions times larger uh, than what we could do just on Earth with current technology. And this seems to me to be a pretty, pretty likely hypothesis. If you're, it's, it's obvious that this is a pretty compelling idea if you're a utilitarian, but even if you place some probability on consequences being something that really matter uh, and creating new positive things being a valuable thing to do, then because the scale of the potential benefit is so enormous, trillions of times larger than the things that we can accomplish on Earth, um, then in expected value terms, um, the astronomical stakes uh, stuff is going to dominate your, your calculation of what's most important. And this pretty naturally leads on to the long-term effects hypothesis, which is that the majority of the value of our actions is from its effects on people that, uh, who don't yet exist. And I think if you buy the astronomical stakes argument, you probably have to buy this one as well. And how can we affect what things happen in a hundred years' time, or a thousand years' time, or a million years' time? We would have to do it indirectly, through a, a, an indirect series of uh, you know, cause and effect, uh, one person affecting the next generation, affecting the next generation, and so on. So it has to be indirect. But I think even if you don't buy the astronomical stakes hypothesis, uh, if you think that there's just more than 10 generations of people yet to come, if humans are just going to continue existing on the Earth for another 500 years or so, then I think the effect on future generations, uh, generations after the, the present one, are likely to dominate the, um, effect, the, the moral effect of your, of your various actions. And you have to trade off the fact that 
your, your effects on future generations, so, or yeah, generations after the present one, are more uncertain, but there's also gonna be a whole lot more of them. So it's, I, this, I'm just ballparking it here. I think if there's more than 10, then you would have to, uh, to yet to come, uh, then you'd have to say that the long-term effects of your actions are more important. And so Bostrom, thinking about this, was wondering if the long-term is really what matters, what should we be looking to do? And the first suggestion you know, from a paper in 2003 was to minimize the risks that humanity uh, faces. So a good signpost for one day achieving astronomical gains would be to achieve an okay outcome today. And the logic here is that so long as we don't permanently ruin things, either by going extinct or having some horrible dictatorship from which we can never escape, then humanity survives and we still have the scientific method and we still have our brains and we can, um, we can live to improve the world another day. We can correct our mistakes and, and, and do better. And this uh, sometimes appears with the name Maxipoc, which is uh, the idea of maximizing the probability of an okay outcome is what we should be aspiring to do in the short term. So how might we go about doing this? The approach one, which I think is the one that most effective altruists are implicitly taking, is uh, they're buying the better position hypothesis, which is that faster human empowerment, so reducing poverty, uh, click, it's not working, yeah, reducing poverty, having better economic growth, improving people's health, improving their education and their understanding of the world, that this kind of thing reliably makes the future more promising. Basically, because they put us in a better position to deal with future challenges. So whatever the threats are to humanity's success in the longer term, if, we're, if we have a lot of wealth and we're healthy and we're educated, then we'll be in a good position to deal with those problems. And I think this makes complete sense if you think we live in a world where the main conflict is between pe humans and nature, people and nature which is a classic uh, story archetype. Because empowerment helps us to deal cl clearly with natural disasters, like uh, super volcanoes maybe, or uh, um, asteroids, uh, diseases and pandemics. If we're, if we're smarter, we can come up with uh, vaccines more quickly and we can prevent them from spreading. White animal suffering is another thing that we could deal with if humans were better empowered, and so on and so on. So if we're in a people versus nature world, I think this, this theory is very compelling. But what if that's not the kind of narrative that's going on in the universe? What if we've seen the enemy and it's us? What if we live in a person versus person conflict story? In that case, the better position hypothesis is a whole lot less clear. Because education, say, puts us in a better position to both solve and create problems more quickly. It's empowering both good and bad things that humanity can do. So for example, we, if, if we're better educated, we have a better economy, we will invent nuclear weapons sooner perhaps, but we're then in a better position to invent ways not to use them because we'll come up with game theory and mutually assured destruction and we'll figure out a way to, to deal with nuclear weapons without killing ourselves. And as an example of you know, how development can, can create risks, the uh, Soviet Union in the late 20s through the uh, late 40s went through an absolutely explosive period of economic growth, one of, the, one of the most rapid modernization processes that we've ever seen, something like China in the modern era. Millions and millions of people moving off very unproductive jobs in farms into factories. And from uh, you know, a human empowerment point of view, this looks absolutely fantastic, because you've got lots of people escaping poverty, improved health, improved education. And probably it was a positive thing, but it also created some risks, because the fact that the USSR industrialized so quickly meant that they were able to develop nuclear weapons very soon after the US developed them, creating, again, the potential for uh, a world-destroying uh, nuclear war that wouldn't have existed, say, if the US had been the only power. And in addition to that, the USSR was controlled by Stalin, one of the most monomaniacal totalitarian dictators ever, really evil guy, who became a lot more powerful because he had this enormous economy behind him. So uh, the USSR developing wasn't an unmitigated positive thing. It, had some, it created some risks to humanity as well. So here I want to present the person versus person hypothesis, which is that most of the threats to the long term are human created. And I think this is true, because except for pandemics, uh, most natural risks like volcanoes or super volcanoes that would be very damaging or asteroids, the annual risk is really, really low. And we can usually recover from most of those things. Uh, like a super volcano, it's very, very hard for that to go out and actually kill absolutely everyone. And um, the Future of Humanity Institute has a paper forthcoming uh, talking about this, how anthropo uh, anthropocentric risk is uh, significantly larger than, than risk from nature. Uh, probably uh, like 10 or 100 times higher. And to get an idea of uh, how would you go about modeling uh, whether uh, human empowerment is positive or negative in a person versus person world, it's, it's definitely not easy. Because you have to think, what is the, the risk to human civilization proportional to? 
Is it a per year risk like you'd have with asteroids, where just every year there's a risk that an asteroid or a comet is going to come by the Earth? Or maybe the risks that we face, or some risks that we face, are proportional to the annual rate of growth. Perhaps if, if we go faster, then we have less time to prepare for changes, and so we're less uh, well able to deal with them when they arrive. And in which case, going more slowly would be better, because we, have more, we can have more potential for, for forethought. Or maybe it's uh, per year, so uh, you think with the, with the nuclear weapons example, you, you've got a risky time between when you invent nuclear weapons and when you invent a technology that neuters nuclear weapons, like mutually assured destruction that stops us from using them. Uh, in that case, if it's just in between a transition between two things, then going faster is fine because you're shortening the time uh, between when you invent the problem and when you solve it. So in that case, maybe you want to go fast. But basically, the modeling gets tricky here uh, pretty, pretty quickly. And so it's hard to come up with uh, really uh, overwhelming arguments uh, one way or the other. But another thing that might be relevant would be the ratio between uh, human prudence versus our power, our technological ability. Uh, and one, one idea that you might have would be that we should only obtain technological capabilities once we're actually ready to deal with them. That's the thing that's going to limit the risks to, to humanity in the long term. We do want to have technologies, but only once we're able to use them safely. So, for example, we give kids scissors, but we don't give them guns, because scissors are useful to a child, uh, and the, the risks that they pose are not so large, because they know that they're going to cut themselves, and, uh, and even if they do, it's not the end of the world. But we don't give them guns because they don't understand them and they don't yet know how to use them safely necessarily. So we wait until they're somewhat older and more mature. So the question I want to pose to you is, do we have the unity, the compassion, and the maturity to wield new technologies of mass destruction? And I think the answer is pretty clearly no, but if you're not convinced, I've got this uh, genius who can tell you, uh, I think he's got a very strong, strong case here, that we need to have more brains before we develop technologies that are extremely risky to us. A uh, very trustworthy fellow. So this would suggest um, a different approach to going about doing good, which would be differential speed up. So if you're trying to do differential speed up rather than just general human empowerment, then you want to be thinking, what things do we most need before other things? What is it beneficial to have first? And also, what things seem least likely to backfire, at least if we get them immediately? And this leads to the question, what are signposts for a good future? And here I'm basically stealing a bunch of this analysis, again, from Bostrom, a talk that he gave um, in Oxford two years ago. He went through a whole lot of different uh, possible things, like proxies for good long-term outcomes that we could measure in the short term. So uh, an analogy that you can have is with uh, a chess game. Early on in the game, obviously you want to be capturing your opponent's pieces, but you can't always see exactly how the game is going to go later on. You don't know how it's going to end, and that's not how good players figure out what the best next move is. They don't map it out to actually checkmating their opponent. Instead, they're looking for proxies in the short term, like do I control a lot of the board, for example, or am I capturing my opponent's pieces? And so that's the kind of thing that we're looking for here, things that we can actually measure in the short term but are a reliable, kind of consistent guide to whether we're making the future more promising. So here's a lot of, uh, a lot of things that he put up. I don't have time to go through all of them. Uh, but you notice, for example, that economic growth has a bit of a question mark next to it because it's just not really clear whether faster economic growth is so good or bad in the long term. And here's some of the ones that did seem more promising, possible promising uh, signposts for us to, to, to guide us into the future. One would be biological cognitive enhancement, so making people smarter in the hope that they'll be able to deal with future challenges in a, in a more wise and prudent way than, than we are. Something like uh, education, but more so. International peace and cooperation to prevent conflict. So if, uh, like a large way in which uh, technologies could go wrong is if they're used as, say, weapons of war or used by, by people against others. Solutions to the AI alignment problem, obviously. If we're going to you know, create uh, machines that are smarter than humans, then we want them to be aligned with, with human interests. And there's uh, good reasons to think that if we don't make a special effort to do this, they're not going to be aligned with our interests. And then one that I've added in is better moral attitudes. So trying to encourage people to care about the welfare of all. Um, I think it's harder to see how that could backfire than to see how economic growth might, might backfire. Though they both have uh, some, some similar values. So if we, can get, if we can get future generations to care about everyone equally, to be very compassionate and not just pursue their own selfish in interests, I think that's a reasonably good signpost for improving the future. And an interesting thing to observe is that this, this whole framing about differential speed up um, actually brings effective altruism somewhat closer to traditional ideas about, about how you might do good. Um, people sometimes say, why are you just focused on curing malaria? Like, is that really the best way to change the world? And I think sometimes people have a point that, that that just might not be the best way to go about it. And more traditional ideas might focus on wise leadership of a, of a country, capacity and institution building to deal with problems. 
improving people's moral attitudes, and also just being wary of rapid change in a way that uh, many of us are not. So, you know, small c conservatism, being worried that if, if everything is just upended and we totally change society overnight, maybe that's, maybe that's going to go wrong and we should be, you know, crossing the river by, by feeling the, so, the stones, so to speak. So what, uh, what do I think are probably the most important causes? Uh, my, my guess is the things like working on risks from biotechnology, AI value alignment, climate change, preventing war and promoting peace in a, in a, in a sense that we ought to be trying to cooperate with one another and avoiding conflict. Uh, you know, improving intelligence within uh, government, and just like forecasting the future and making good collective decisions, and similar such things, which I think are probably a more reliable guide to improving the future than simply trying to increase GDP growth. What about reducing poverty? Am I saying that reducing poverty isn't good? Uh, no, I don't think that that's the case. Because reducing poverty also raises global sanity through more education and people who are, who are smarter, which leads to more cosmopolitan moral values, uh, and leads to better government as well. And people who have put a lot more thought into this than me uh, generally think that it's probably good overall. So all I'm saying is that it might not be as good as it initially appears to be, but I'm certainly not saying that it's, that it's neutral or negative. And if you'd like to explore this more, a really good thesis is on the overwhelming importance of shaping the far future, uh, where one of our trustees, Nick Beckstead, concludes that uh, improving economic growth is probably uh, positive, just not, maybe not as positive as it might first look. Another one is The Moral Consequences of Economic Growth by Benjamin Friedman. It talks about uh, the changes that you get in a society when it uh, stagnates economically, and how you often get like, quite rapid moral regression. People are reverting to more tribal values, being less likely to cooperate one another, and uh, less empathetic. So quite an interesting book from about 2006, I think. But something to note is that poverty really isn't that neglected in, in the scheme of things. It's not a terribly unusual cause, which is one reason, that we, one reason that we talk about it a lot, because it's easy to explain to people that it's good if you save lives and, and reduce poverty. But reducing poverty absorbs something like more than half, I'd say, of all effort by effective altruists, certainly more than half of, of all donations. Uh, so it's like a really large focus area, I think, maybe relative to the strength of the arguments. And it's a significant fraction of all actions by the poor themselves, of billions of people who are in uh, relative poverty or, or global poverty. They're trying to get out of poverty um, you know, themselves. And this is something that we should consider when thinking, like, is this really a, a neglected opportunity? It's true, they don't have necessarily the, the same resources. But if you, if you add it all up, I think there's a lot of work going into trying to prevent poverty. There's also found, like, many foundations that are focused on this, including many of the largest, quite a lot of government aid. So I think poverty is neglected relative to some things but it's probably not among the most neglected problems in the world. And if you compare that with, say, work on, you know, how many NGOs and foundations are there working on international coordination, new dangerous technologies, peace, improving forecasting, this kind of work is reasonably obscure by comparison. And so I think there might be more low-hanging fruit here, because fewer people are, are working on it. Yeah, there's relatively few people who, you know, lots of people say, I want to end poverty, you know, you know, if you meet a 16-year-old, but if they say, I really want to improve forecasting ability within the intelligence services, that is, that is not a common thing for, you know, teenagers to dream of doing with their, with their career. Uh, and in addition, I think other, th these other ways for do of doing good um, can be quite a good fit for us. So effective altruism is sometimes accused of being filled with elites. Uh, and I think that is uh, potentially quite problematic in some ways, that we can be very out of touch, like maybe we just haven't experienced poverty ourselves, so that could, so that could blinker us. But it also creates some opportunities, potentially, if we have a lot of connections with people in government or within academia. So I think effective altruists, many people here, would, be, would have an unusually good shot at guiding governance and public service, you know, rising to the, to the top levels within important institutions within society guiding specific new technologies, because we're particularly clued into what kinds of things are being developed in the next five or 10 years, and think about how can we make sure that they're used in wise ways rather than risky ways. And we might be in a better position, or in a good position, to improve society's moral values as well. Though I think this is a bit more questionable, right? Many of us might be out of touch with, with a lot of people in society. I personally often don't feel like I'm super in touch with, uh, with a lot of people. And so maybe, like, on the one hand, we, like, have potentially a large audience, but you know, uh, are we actually very good at persuading uh, most people in society to change their moral values and care more about people overseas? I think that that's, that's an open question. So the bottom lines here, uh, the indirect effects are crucial, though they're really hard to estimate. I think peace and kind of collective wisdom are somewhat underrated by people in this community. Uh, and probably that uh, there's an excessive focus on economic growth and health relative to, to other cause areas that might be more reliable, that might have more reliable signposts to, to improving the future and be, and be somewhat more neglected. Uh, but I think 
Is it a cliche to say further research is needed? But I think further research really is needed this time uh, because this could be one of the things that is really that is causing us to actually not do things that are that are terribly valuable. And I, of course, people have known about this problem for years. You know, I, I started working at the Center for Effective Altruism four years ago. This isn't a, a new concern. But because it's like a bit demoralizing to think about you know, how, how hard it can be to predict the long-term effects of your actions and how hard it is to have really good insights here, um, th this topic just kind of goes a bit neglected in, in my view. I think it would be valuable to get more you know, smart people really thinking seriously about this and putting in you know, months or years of work, uh, you know, coming up with their own ideas and their own models for how we can improve society in the long term. But all that said, given how hard it is to uh, think about this topic, uh, above might all be misguided. I wouldn't like give uh, too much stock to any specific thing that I've said, but I think the overall issue is, uh, is quite important. So I'd like to see, you know, I'd like to have great conversations here in the rest of the conference. Thanks so much. So I can uh, take questions for five minutes. Oh, go for it. Hi. Uh, what are the most effective interventions you're aware of for increasing peace? Maybe if you could focus especially in the Middle East. Right. <laughs> I, unfortunately, I'm not an expert on that. And um, uh, yeah, Middle East sounds uh, particularly tricky. I think uh, the thing that I'd be focusing on if I was working on peace would be trying to get China and the US to get along so they don't have a, have a massive war. Trying to get like greater understanding of the interests of like of the Chinese government and the Chinese people in the US and, and vice versa. So they don't like accidentally come to blows. Uh, potentially also things around uh, nuclear security. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I, I haven't like gotten to that level of thinking exactly how would you do uh, peace interventions. I think like change, you know, changing values so that people just find war more ab abhorrent. That's something that's already happened and it's been very valuable. Um, there's like there's organizations like Plowshares uh, Foundation which do work on trying to improve cooperation and peace. Like generally going into the foreign service, for example, and uh, just having a very uh, anti-war attitude. I think it could be could be positive, but yeah, it's uh, I haven't thought that much about it at that uh, you know specific level. Yeah. Uh, you suggested that biological cognitive enhancement could be a promising route forward, but you seem less confident about say education. Yeah. I was wondering if you could contrast those. Uh, yeah, you have to read Bostrom's paper on that because uh, I'm basically just I was just copying up what, what he said there, and I'm actually not entirely sure what the logic is. Uh, yeah, but they, had, they did do some modeling on, on cognitive enhancement uh, as against general, uh, general improvements in education. And I, and I think they thought there were like some different effects. So if you look at the Future of Humanity Institute website or Nick Bostrom's website, I think you'll get the answer on there. Uh, and I'll come talk to you after and we'll find it. Yeah? Uh, yeah, and kind of going off of that question, um, is there any focus on the distribution of technologies like cognitive enhancement and just any kind of biotech? Because it seems like uh, the distribution of current technologies in healthcare and you know economic growth that there seem to be flaws in the distribution. So it would be unequal and would probably be centered around people who are also in EA and going back to that elitism of who would yeah. get these technologies once they're made and would yeah. it really help everyone or would it really help those who can afford it? Yeah, um, so there's a, there's a lot of issues there. Um, so I think that's one reason to prefer increasing economic growth in the developing world rather than the rich world is that, in, uh, imagine that increasing uh, like equality um, in like ability to, to, to solve problems, uh, like increasing yeah, income equality and education equality is probably a safer bet than improving the frontier where you're maybe more likely to invent new dangerous uh, things with, um, with that education. Um, it's not, in, yeah, it's not completely obvious that um, having greater equality of access to all, to all these new things uh, would necessarily be positive. If something is dangerous and destabilizing, then maybe you want to just try it on a tiny number of people first before it's uh, scaled up to, to lots of people. I mean, I think if you look at most technologies, initially they're just used by, they're very expensive and they're just used by an elite, but then they filter out to everyone gradually as it becomes cheap to produce them, like smartphones, that, that process is happening. Uh, and it's happening with other education technology as well. Um, but D depending on the technology, it might be might be bad for everyone to, to have access to it. Like sometimes, like like with nuclear weapons, uh, keep coming back to that example. 
It could have been good if the US was the only country that had nuclear weapons. And they, there were a lot of negotiations potentially of uh, all countries uh, deciding not to have nuclear weapons, or the US considered just trying to maintain a complete advantage and being the only country that ever has them. And it's possible to imagine that like, either of those scenarios could be more stable than what we have now, where you know, one person could potentially destroy the entire world with the click of a button. Um, so, so, yeah, it's re really complicated. We can talk about it later if you like. Anyone else? Yeah? Um, in your talk, you mentioned about moral values and like the having more shared uh, moral values. And yeah. can you throw some light in terms of uh, you know dissemination of those moral values in such culturally diverse world? You know. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear that. So you talked about moral values and having uh, estab some way of actually propagating and establishing common moral values. Moral values. Yeah, moral values. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, holding the mic to close. It's just, uh, it's just uh, yeah, the, the audio is not okay. Um, so if you could, uh, you know, a little bit, uh, elaborate more okay. in in terms of what techniques or apparatus we would use to establish okay. and propagate that. Yeah. So to some extent, I think we're we're doing this already. Um, so for example, I think the effective altruism movement as a whole encourages people to take a global perspective on things and give significant weight to the effects on, say, people in other countries. When if, if I think most people, when they're deciding what policies their government should implement, just think uh, like, how will this affect the citizens of, citizens of this country? Which I can often find quite confronting, and people have that have that mindset. Uh, but we're saying no, you've got to think about not just like healthcare in your own country, but like what could your country do to improve health uh, globally. I think that's like one of those shifts in mindset that's, that's very valuable. You've also got, uh, we're trying to encourage people to be concerned about the welfare of animals, uh, both in, like, fact, in farms where we treat them badly, or, um, or even animals in nature as a more, more extreme case. We're also trying to get people to think long term, to think about impacts on future generations, like not just their children's children, but uh, far, far beyond that. I think those are, like, those are potentially the most important moral shifts I think you can get. Basically, this idea that we shouldn't just be focused on ourselves or our family or people who look like us or sound like us, but thinking in, like, about the effects of our actions on, on everyone uh, and, and all kinds of beings at, at all times. And, and we, do, we do kind of uh, push that, but I think we, we could potentially be more focused on uh, changing moral values and reaching a lot of people with that message if, if that was what we were explicitly trying to do. Yeah. All right, I think uh, I'm out of time. So thanks so much. Uh, look forward to talking.